everybody, my name is Ellery and I'm part of the students team here at Covenant. We are so glad that you decided to stop by our YouTube channel today. If you are new here, text the word new to the number on the screen and we would love to get to know you and send you a gift. And now let's jump into our teaching time. Thanks for joining us today. Working out forgiveness. Working out forgiveness. All right, forgiveness is, is one of those uh, topics that no one thinks they need, but everybody does. I mean, it's surprising, right? To You know, I think I got everybody forgiven, and then I realized that I don't. And so, um, I don't know if you're like me. I, I love forgiveness when it's coming toward me. You know, I don't like it as much when I'm, I'm called to offer it out to other people. So, you know, here's the deal. This is... This is the thing we've got to face is that nothing clouds our vision, nothing keeps us from praying, nothing keeps us from walking faithfully with Jesus more than unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is a, is a blockade toward grace and it, it has to be dealt with. And have you ever thought, I mean, isn't this true for you, that you've wondered sometimes just... How that one thing that somebody said to you could get stuck so deeply in your crawl that you can't get rid of it. Or how that, that one person, you know, you're, you're good with everybody else, that one person gets on your last nerve. Right? Forgiveness is something we all need. And so I'm going to be talking about it over the next few weeks. So today, what I want to do is I want to take you to what I think is a foundational passage for us as we begin this series. Uh, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'll, I'll just say that in this short little section that I'm going to walk us through today, the Apostle Paul, who I mean, I would say the great apostle Paul, who's probably the, you know, the greatest Christian who ever lived, lets us in to his heart and says, I, I've got something that is, he calls it a thorn in my flesh. I've, I, I've got a thorn. Now, I'll just tell you, I'm, I'm a little bit ashamed to tell you that I've never preached on this passage. In all the years, 35 plus years of preaching, I've never preached on the passage. So, uh, I'm also, that means I'm excited that I, that I get to, because I'm going to tell you, this is an amazing little couple of verses, few verses that Paul shares with us, and... Uh, we're going to look at it today, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, he says, he talks about a thorn. So, what is a thorn? You know, we, we think about it as a briar, you know, a scratch, something that would scratch you, a sharp object. The, the word in the original language is, it sounds really cool, it's scolops. And it really means any sharp object that is continually sticking in you. So I think about a splinter that you can't get rid of. You know, it's stuck in, it's stuck in your finger or your hand and, and it hurts and you can't seem to get it out. You're working at it, but you can't get it out. Um, sometimes we talk about, we're not, we don't ride horses, most of us, but talking about having a burr in your saddle. You know, every time you're going along, something's sticking in you. Uh, I, I heard somebody last night say uh, the, the root word actually is the word. It's not a little thing. The root word actually is tent stake. I got a tent stake sticking in me. You know, whatever it is, it, uh, it's, it's, it's pricking me, it's irritating me, and it hurts which is why I, I entitled this message, The Gift That Keeps on Giving. All right, it's, it's stuck, 
and I can't get rid of it. You know, I want to, but I can't. Now, some people uh, have tried to figure out what, what Paul is talking about when he says, I've got a thorn in my flesh. Some people have, have supposed that it was his, his eye problem because apparently uh, he had a difficult time either with a dripping eye um, or he, he, his vision was giving him problems. Uh, there are several letters where he says, you know, I've, I've dictated my thoughts to this one person, but I signed it at the end, and you know it's me because you can see the great big letters that I signed it with. Um, Paul had, uh, I don't know if Paul could see fine, but there was a time, you know, when, when he was on the road to Damascus when he met Jesus, and for a time he was blind. And so some people have thought, you know, that he never really got his eyesight back the way it was before. Uh, others have supposed that Paul had these raging headaches. Um, there was a time when Paul almost, well, of course, Paul almost died a bunch of times. But there was this time where apparently he had malaria, and one of the side effects of malaria are these just debilitating headaches. And so some people have, have thought, well, maybe that's what he's talking about here. Um, Others think that the thorn is a person or a group of people. There were these, there were these folks, these Jewish uh, people, a group of Jewish opponents that followed Paul around everywhere he went. If you could imagine, you're going in a new place, you go to talk about Jesus, you're sharing your heart with them, and then you've got a group of people who are standing near you or following you or following up behind you saying, he's a liar. He, he's not telling you the truth. Don't believe him. He's a false prophet. And there was a group of people that, that went behind Paul everywhere he went. So some people think that, that's what he's talking about here. Interestingly, y'all, the Bible does not tell us which one it is. Which I think is a really good thing. Because that way I can take whatever it is that is exasperating me and I can put it right in that slot. And I can say, I, I've got something that is sticking in me and, and I, I cannot get rid of it. You know, Paul in this passage actually gives us a lot of possibilities. He says in, uh, in verse 10 of chapter 12, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And so he, he says here, you know, over time I've experienced all kinds of things that have made me weak, they have exhausted me. They have worn me out. And I don't know what that is for you. Might be a bunch of things. It could be something that is physical or something that is mental. It could be a, some circumstances that are beyond your control. But I'll tell you, for a lot of people, when you think about, I've got a thorn in my side, got a thorn in my flesh. The thorn has a first and a last name. And that's where you go first. You're thinking about someone who is hard to deal with and you don't know what to do. That person is, is your thorn. So anyway, let's look. Let's look at what Paul says in this passage. Uh, start with like the nature of a thorn. I mean, where does, where does a thorn come from? Where does something that is difficult in your life come from? Look what he says in verse 7, second half of verse 7. He says, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Now, can I, can I read it again? It says, there was given me a thorn in my flesh. So, did you, did you understand what he was saying? He says, 
God gave it to me. God gave me this. So, surprise, it's a gift. Well, thank you, Lord. Take it back. <laughs> I, I mean, I appreciate you thinking of me, but uh, thanks, but no thanks. Take, take it back. You know, I, I don't want it. I mean, are you with me? I love when God's giving out blessings. I don't like when He's giving out thorns. Now, this, this brings me to what is a, this, this is a theological dilemma that everybody deals with. Every, at one point or another, someone has asked you or you've thought yourself, you know, how is it that if God is good and God loves me, um, how, how, could, how could really hard things bad things happen to me if he loves me how can a how can a good and powerful god allow things in my life and on top of that if you read this how how can he allow the devil to be in on it because that's what he says here i mean this this is the question why do why do bad things happen to good people and Every one of us has asked it, and people have asked us. I mean, how do you, how do you answer a question like that? It's hard, isn't it? Because you go back to what you know that the Scriptures say. You know, is, is God really in charge of this universe? Well, yes. You know, is God all-powerful? I mean, can He do anything? Yes, he can. Is he all knowing? Yes, he is. So Paul's struggling with this too, and what he comes to he comes to this conclusion: God must have been okay with it. God must have been okay, and God has even given the devil permission to participate in it. That's troubling, isn't it? I mean, listen, he's. He's saying, look, sometimes God gives a thorn. He lets the devil deliver it, and it hurts. And that, and that's, that's what Paul says here. He goes on, verse 8, he says, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Paul says, I prayed and prayed and prayed. Now, does that mean that Paul prayed about it three times? Well, I think... That what he was saying here, three is one of those biblical numbers of completion. I think he said, and I beg the Lord over and over and over again to remove it because it's painful. I want it gone. I don't like it. I don't know why he won't take it away from me. And what is the answer to that? Well... Could it be that God is not finished using that gift in my life yet? So let's, let's go on and see what he says. Uh, think about it. Why, why, would God, why would God give me a gift <laughs> like this, right? Why, why would he do that? Well, two reasons. First reason is this. To show me something that is new and wonderful. He wants to show me something. He wants to get my attention so he can show me something really good in my life. Now, earlier in chapter 12, Paul, Paul writes these words. He says, I know a man in Christ who... Fourteen years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. Now, who is that man? Well, Paul is so humble 
that he doesn't even say, well, that man was me. I know a man because it's me. Something, something happened where Paul was allowed to see heaven. And he says, you know, I don't know if, if it was a vision. I don't know if I was really there. All I know is that God showed me something that very few people have ever seen. He, he showed me all of his glory and wonder. And, and it, was, it was so amazing that I don't even have words to be able to describe it. Now, he says, I was caught up to the third heaven. Now, quickly, that doesn't mean that there are three levels of heaven. Really, it means I was caught up to the highest realm. Uh, sometimes, biblically, the, like the, the, the lowest realm is earth, where we live. God's still working here, but this is where we live, and God works in our lives. There's, a, there's another realm that we do not see, and we know God is working, that His angels are ministering to us, going back and forth from His presence. We can't see that, but we know that it's there. That's like the second level. And then there's where God lives which is the, the highest level. He calls it here the third heaven. Paul says, I don't know exactly how this worked. I just know that I saw into the throne room of God and I was allowed to, to come back and try my best to describe it. So sometimes the Lord allows a thorn even, hey, even a thorny person in my life so that he can show me something new. And, I mean, beyond the normal, because he wants to get my attention. So he pricks you, pricks me. And I'm going, don't prick me. <laughs> you know, it hurts. But as I begin to wake up, from the norm and I start to pay attention God wants to do something wants to show me something in my life that I have not seen so far now there's a second reason the second reason and Paul's very clear with this one it, he says it's to keep me from exalting myself Again, back to verse 7, he says, To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. Because of what I'd seen, God gave me a thorn, which then keeps me dependent upon Him. Because see, the problem is, without a thorn, when you see something new, all of a sudden you start taking credit for it. You start believing that it had something to do with you, that you're special. You know, hey, God and I are doing this together. We're, we're a part of something really great. And so he says, so God gave me a thorn to make sure I didn't take credit for it. To keep me from, he says, to keep me from being conceited. To, to keep me right there. My need for God on the forefront. I mean, he's... He's pretty sharp here. He says, look, my pride has a tendency to get in my way. And so sometimes God says, well, then I'm going to give you a gift. So that your pride doesn't get the best of you. Again, Paul saw something that very few people have seen. I mean, he got to actually witness Heaven before going to heaven. And that, that could cause anybody to say, you know, uh, I, must be some, I must be something. God, I must be better than everybody else. And so he says, so God gave me a thorn for my own good. He, he disciplined me with this difficult thing in my life. Now, Hebrews chapter 12 says it this way. Uh, no discipline 
seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So, you with me? Uh, One of the reasons is to show me something good. The other reason is to keep me from missing out on the blessing because I've had my eyes in the wrong place. To keep me from the sin of self-sufficiency. That leads me to the last thing that Paul says here. He says, okay, listen, I've got this thorn and it is painful. I want it to go away and it, it seems like I've had it forever. I've prayed and prayed and prayed about it and the Lord has not taken it away from me yet. But I've asked him to. Have you ever asked the Lord to take something away from you? A lot of times we, 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 we forget to praise him. But we don't forget to say, Lord, take this away. This thing is driving me crazy. Okay, I'm, I'm praying. And you know, that's a legitimate prayer, y'all. Lord, take this thorn out of me. And so... If you pray a legitimate prayer, God's going to answer your prayer. So, how will he answer your prayer? Well, one of three ways. He's either going to say yes or no or, well, not yet. And the last one's the hardest one, isn't it? All right, if he just said no, I'd get it. But he uh, not yet. I, I'm, I'm still... I'm still doing some work here. So this is what he says to Paul. Paul's, remember, praying his guts out. He says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Then Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. I'm going to thank the Lord for the thorn. I'm going to thank Him that He's given me this incredible gift. Because He's still working in me. He's doing something in me. God said, hey, I'm going to leave the splinter in a little longer. Because I'm not through doing in you what I want to do. I'm, I'm going to do in you what you could never do for yourself. He said, I'm, I'm going to give you the power to deal with the thorn. I'm going to give you the power to walk with me, to keep your eyes on me, to move forward, even though you've got something sticking in you. And he calls it, he calls it grace. You know, grace is the goodness of God poured out on us, poured in our cup, Poured, filled to the top, running over into the ground. He says, I'm going to give you a bunch of grace. Because I'm doing something in you. I'm I'm, I'm making you compassionate. I'm working on your character. I'm going to draw you closer to me. And that is a better answer for you than what you wanted me to to answer in the first place. So I'm not going to answer the prayer you wanted you the way you wanted me to right now. You know, how, how many of you have said, yep, the Lord did not answer my prayer the way I wanted Him to. You know, I said, Lord, would you kill my husband? He didn't do it. Oh, would you just, would you, would you make my neighbor move away? Get a new job. Would you make my sister-in-law stop gossiping about me? He just says, uh, no. Instead, I'm going to give you something better than you asked for. I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to give you enough grace to be able to be above it. And I, and I love what he says. He, he says, I have, I'm going to give you sufficient grace. I'm going to give you 
enough grace to be able to deal with it. And listen, there is no thorn that anybody has ever dealt with where there's not enough grace to deal with it. Which is why that if God had said yes to Paul, it would not, as, it would not have been as good an answer as the answer that he got. I am going to give you grace. Paul also said this in 2 Corinthians. He says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Well, that just about covers it, doesn't it? You know, in everything you're going through, every Every situation you're going through, every moment of your life, I've got enough grace to pour out on you. And I don't know, I, I've, I've found God is rarely satisfied with just giving me enough grace. Usually He gives me bonus grace. He just pours out grace. Which is also a surprise, isn't it? I get all the grace I need and more you know, the difference between a victorious Christian and a defeated Christian. A victorious Christian is being showered in grace. And a defeated Christian is trying to pick the splinter out of their flesh. And they're focusing on themselves and their eyes are not on God. And they will end up missing... The blessing that God is trying to show them. The new thing that God's trying to do in their lives. Now listen, uh, Paul never tells us whether God took it away. And you know what? I think that's good too. He just says, there's plenty of grace. You know, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie. It's called uh, Paul... The Apostle of God. And I've just, I'm, I'm amazed at everything that Paul does and says in that movie. I'm so impressed. And I understand Paul a lot better now that I've read this passage. Paul is beaten. He is thrown down in a stinking hole of a dungeon. He's alone. He is, he is cold and he is hungry and he is suffering. And he still loves the guard that beat him. He still loves the people that are putting him through all of this. He's got a heart of incredible forgiveness. And he doesn't even see it as a, a tent stake stuck in him. He sees it as a very tiny thing. Because all he can think about is how God has been so gracious to him. How God has forgiven him. How God has done what he did not deserve. And so the little thing that somebody has done to him, he doesn't even see it. Because all he can see is God's grace given to him. So today, we're going to have communion together. Which is a picture of God's grace to us. It is all about his forgiveness. What He has done for us when we did not deserve it. And so he's, he's teaching us how to be more like Him. As we see Him at this table today. So Lord, we, we offer ourselves to You as Your people. And we thank You for every good gift that you have given because you have a plan for us. You want to make something incredible out of us. You want to weed out any selfishness or sin in us that we might give honor and glory to God. And we're okay with that. Now Lord, you teach us. You, you give your grace to us in abundance just as you promise, in Jesus' name.